Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, English language interview with Spanish philosopher and philosophy professor Ernesto Castro, born in Madrid into a family well acquainted with the world of academia that values all kinds of cultural and artistic expressions. Ernesto is currently a professor at Madrid's Universidad Autónoma and has recently issued his seventh book. Yeah, you heard that well. Seventh book, El Gran Pan Ha Muerto, The Great Pan is dead. He's hard at work on devising his own philosophical system and remains very active on YouTube, where his channel has now reached 139,000 subscribers. Now, the reason why we're sitting down to chat with him today is that his book on post-continental realism, largely based on research that he conducted for his PhD dissertation, has recently become available in an English translation. And it is our hope that this conversation will help give Ernesto and his work more exposure within the English-speaking world. Ernesto Castro, welcome, and thanks for being here. Thanks uh, for interviewing me. Well, um, I was um, you know, reading uh, your book, and before we get into uh, talking a little bit more in depth about the book, uh, I wanted to ask you what your earliest memories related to uh, philosophy are and when and why you decided to concentrate on philosophy, on this field of study. Hmm. My father teaches philosophy at the university. As you have said, my family is well acquainted with uh, academia, with uh, philosophical and artistic problems. My mother also teaches philosophy in the high school, and my sister. Uh, is also currently doing his, her PhD on feminist philosophy. The only uh, one who hasn't studied uh, philosophy is my brother, but he has studied uh, comparative literature in, at uh, King's College London, and that's the reason why he and Natalia Baizan, uh, his uh, fiancé, uh, have uh, translated the, the book we are uh, talking now about. So. Mm, I think it is it it was in there it was in the in the water uh, in Madrid here when I, where I live uh, the philosoph philosophy was uh, pouring out of the tap and the reason I, I getting jokes aside I decided to study the philosophy is because I as a teenager I wrote very bad poetry, uh, a poetry of ideas, uh, an intellectual poetry. And I thought um, this career, this particular career, would fit my poetical inspiration. What really happened is that philosophy uh, fit on poetry and uh, expels expel the, the poet I, I was in uh, my teenage years. And that's more or less my trajectory. I I started writing poetry, and then I, prose uh, triumph uh, make his way uh, through uh, the career. So you you could say that poetry brought you to philosophy in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm mm, going back to poetry now. Uh, my first. Uh, mm, Po poetical book uh, will be published next year. It's a, a book I finished uh, 10 years ago in 2010. But uh, as uh, or as, as the classical poet of uh, of Rome said, uh, you know uh, it's a good uh, poet uh, poem or poetry book when you uh, get uh, get uh, you. Uh, Put it away for ten years and and read it back, yeah. And and I wrote I wrote back the the book and I thought it was uh, publishable more or less, yeah. So so time has to go by <laughs> before <laughs> poetry is is publishable, almost like like a fine wine or something like that. <laughs> so yeah. well, the the book that we're talking about though is not the latest book that you put out, but it's uh, uh, a book that uh, is based on the research that you did for your uh, dissertation uh, on post-continental realism. Um, so how do you remember your earliest contacts with post-continental realism and what specifically 
attracted you about this group of philosophers? Mm -hmm. I came across uh, postcontinental realism reading about Nietzsche. Maurizio Ferraris, the Italian member of this movement, uh, has a book about Nietzsche in which uh, he argues that Nietzsche is not a postmodern avant la lettre. Uh, Nietzsche was very influenced by Friedrich Albert Lange, mm -hmm. uh, who has a history of materialism. And mm, some of uh, his thoughts uh, were uh, inspired by the materialist and scientific uh, projects of uh, his time, or of his epoch. And it's an anachronism to think ab about Nietzsche in postmodern post, uh, uh, terms. That's, that was the, the first book I wrote, I wrote about uh, a postcontinental author, about uh, um, Ferraris. And then I started uh, reading other books, most of them uh, translated and published in uh, Caja Negra Books, uh, which is a publishing house uh, from Argentina who has uh, translated most of the of the work uh, I, um, wo I work about in the PhD. And that's more or less the, the history of my relationship with uh, postcontinental realism. And, and why were you attracted to those uh, philosophers in particular? Is there any specific reason that uh, made you become more interested in mm -hmm. those kinds of philosophers? Yeah. My first book uh, was titled Contra la Postmodernidad Against Postmodernity. And these authors uh, sell themselves as uh, against postmodernity. postmodernity and they uh, they argue they try to go uh, beyond the language uh, prison of the 20th century philosophy when i read them uh, more carefully i notice that uh, they are uh, very much influenced by postmodern authors such as jacques derrida uh, mauricio ferraris is a disciple a follower of uh, jacques derrida but uh, the way in which uh, they um, um, reconstruct the influence of these uh, postmodern authors, I think is very interesting. And, and it also has been very influential for my own uh, system of philosophy, philosophical system, yeah. Is, is there any uh, reason why uh, they are known as post-continental? What, what does the continent refer to in yeah. that case? <laughs> they are not known as that. That's a, a, a word I have um, uh, proposed to uh, unify uh, them since in, in this book I, 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 uh, I tackle six authors. Uh, four of them are um, mainly known as speculative realists, mm -hmm. and uh, two of them, Marcus Gabriel and Maurice Ferraris, uh, prefer to call themselves new realists. But uh, these two adjectives, new and speculative, I argue that is they are not uh, specific; they are uh, vague and abstract, and doesn't um, doesn't tackle the genealogical history of uh, what from from where they uh, start thinking postcontinental refers to uh, a, a type of philosophy who tries to go further than the uh, post -cont the continental tradition that this is a, a anglo-saxon distinction a british distinction mm -hmm. between analytical philosophy uh, which uh, was invented in Vienna in in the in the in the continental Europe, Europe but after second world war uh, since most of these philosophers were Jews uh, they emigrate to the United States and to Britain and in the second half of the 20th century was this distinction very clear very cut, uh, cut clear uh, between a continental philosophy interested in aesthetics, ethics, uh, politics, uh, phenomenology and its successors, existentialism, uh, structuralism, and the analytical tradition, which uh, was uh, very strong in philosophy of uh, thought, of language and science. And these authors go beyond this distinction, which can be reconstructed uh, in the 
critic of pure reason of Kant. That's uh, a part of the of the PhD was uh, dedicated to to reconstruct this distinction to the parts of the of that important book. Uh, they go beyond this distinction, uh, mm, mixing. Uh, influence of uh, analytical and continental uh, philosophers. That more or less, in, very briefly, mm -hmm. the reason why I call I prefer to call them postcontinental instead of speculative or new. Uh, there are uh, there has been a lot of new realists in the history of uh, Occident, uh, Occidental or Western. Sorry, sorry, Western <laughs> Western philosophy, and uh, that's why I prefer postcontinental. Yeah. Is it uh, is would you say that there is uh, something or are there any features that you consider to be uh, unique about these authors, this group of authors that somehow uh, would set them apart from other present day philosophical schools? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What I try in the book is to define uh, realism. I define realism minimalistically as the thesis that something exists and can be known by us being independent from us. And having these three parts, uh, you can, realists have uh, three types of enemies, uh, nihilists who deny the existence of, rea of that reality, mm -hmm. except exceptics who deny the possibility of knowledge and idealists who say, okay, this reality exists and we can know about them, about it, but uh, is dependent from us. And what I, what I argue through the book is that uh, you cannot be a complete realist about everything. You have to be fictionalist or nihilist or executive or idealist about appearances, fictions, and other things. And most of these authors are rarely uh, exceptics, nihilist or idealist about the outer world which was a, a, a problem in modern philosophy from Descartes, Descartes till uh, Heidegger or till Kant, but they are realists, they are profoundly realist about the universals, the uh, general categories with which we uh, comprehend the world. And that's a very uh, interesting feature. They are realist about universals, which which was the topic of the, of the philosophical debate in the um, in the medieval epoch, and they are nihilist, idealist, or exceptics about the outer world. Uh, Marcus Gabriel is very well known uh, by his book, uh, Why the World Doesn't Exist. The, wor uh, the world doesn't exist, but the categories, the universal categories with which we comprehend reality, uh, they exist in a very particular way. That's more or less what uh, set them apart of, uh, of the tradition, of the realist tradition, and also from the recent uh, philosophical movements uh, who, which uh, have been uh, mostly uh, constructivist, uh, which is the, the same as saying idealists. What, what you're uh, describing about the, these authors somehow uh, sounds to me a little bit like a little bit of a paradox in a sense. Uh, <laughs> is, is there any way to account for or or explain uh, briefly that, that that paradox, or is this something that we need to read the whole book for? <laughs> you have to read the whole book. You have to, yeah, yeah. You have to read it first. <laughs> you don't have to buy it though. You you can uh, download it uh, freely since uh, it has been uh, published with a, a funding by Fundación Sicomoro, uh, which I uh, for for whom for, for which I thank them, and uh, it's it's free to download in my website. And uh, and but if you want to also spend your dollars in that in that book, you can also do it. Yeah, you have to uh, read it, not buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so the uh, I I will just take uh, advantage of that to say that your uh, website is ernestocastro.com, and anyone That's that uh, would like to know more about Ernesto Castro and his work and uh, his different activities should check out ernestocastro.com. Uh, now, this book, uh, Realismo Postcontinental or po Postcontinental Realism, is largely based on the research that you uh, carried out for your PhD uh, dissertation a few years ago. And so I'm wondering, in what ways has the content of the book 
evolved or changed mm -hmm. from the original dissertation uh, until its later publication mm -hmm. in book form. Yeah, I the changes uh, have been mostly stylistical. I, I've tried to be more clear, more concise, and I, I very much agree with that famous quote of Ortega said, clarity is the philosopher's uh, courtesy. Oh. And and I've tried to be as as courteous as <laughs> as uh, I can in the in the book. I uh, in the PhD in the PhD there was uh, the original quotes in German, French, and English were in the footnotes, and I just uh, eliminated them. I when I work in the PhD, uh, as I said in the prologue, I try to be uh, as um, as uh, divulgative as possible, uh, which is uh, I, I think since when when you work in a in a field like this one, which is very new, uh, you the other philosophers of the academia are as no, as versed or as acquaintance with uh, with this uh, movement as the rest of the world. So mm -hmm. I if if I were mm, doing a, a PhD on on a topic uh, very well known as, I don't know, Plato, Aristotle, or Kant, uh, I, will ha I will have to be more uh, Baroque, I will say, more abstruse. I, I mm -hmm. will have to be more, um, mm, hmm. yeah, that, that's, that's more or less the, the difference. But being the first PhD on uh, postcontinental realism in the Spanish-speaking world and one of the first uh, in the world in the gen in general i thought better to uh, approach the phd as an essay and it the the revisions to publish it were very yeah i say stylistically more more mostly and i suppose you were also the first phd uh, to actually refer to these authors as post-continental realists, yeah, uh, that, that's co coining that word. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think, yeah. I hope, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> now you said that uh, before. I, I remember that you said that um, these authors have had uh, an, a profound impact on your own um, uh, philosophical system that you are working on uh, devising, that you're working on creating. Uh, uh, currently, uh, so I'm wondering in what ways uh, is your system influenced by post-continental realism and uh, in what ways does your system as it is right now differ from it? So how is it similar to post-continental realism and how is it different from it? Mm -hmm. uh, my philosophical system is called uh, generic naturalism. Uh, the two uh, concepts, uh, main concepts of, of this uh, philosophical system are nature and gender. And uh, nature is understood not at, as something given, as something fixed, but as mm, that which evolves, uh, as in this is not a, a, an original idea, is in Heraclito, is in Darwin, is in Spinoza, is in uh, Schelling. Uh, and I try to uh, mix this um, move, this uh, concept of nature as a movement, as a force, with a concept of the universals, of the general concepts with which we comprehend the world as something not constructed by humanity, but uh, something that is more or less reified or fixed in, in reality. Yeah? So nature is not what is given, it's what gives new genders, mm -hmm. genders in, in a very generic way, uh, way or, or meaning. Uh, I try, I, in my philosoph for my philosophical system, uh, it's very important the feminist thought about these uh, things, but also uh, the categories of Porphyrius, of uh, Aristoteles, and I try to, uh, comprehend gender as a general category to comprehend categories. Mm -hmm. Why reality tends to get fixed in some uh, genders that uh, iterate themselves through time. That's the, the 
like uh, the species in the biological world or like generations in the political world. And so uh, from this general ontology uh, uh, constructed with the concepts of uh, or ideas of gender and nature, I uh, make like regional ontology or uh, particular ontology on political, uh, epistemological, aesthetical, and ethical uh, fields. And that's more or less the things I'm working on right now. I have very, I have uh, very clear the general view of the system based on those two concepts. But what I have to work through is the uh, particularities, in, mostly in the epistemological and sociological field, uh, the field uh, related with uh, or to um, science. Uh, it's a it's a work of our life in this mm-hmm. in this time of of systematization. Mm-hmm. It's 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 a work that you plan to be carrying out throughout yeah. the rest of your life, the work of a lifetime. And I would say uh, what, what what I'm interested in is knowing in in, in what way uh, is this system of yours uh, similar and different from uh, ah, yeah, sure. the sure, the, sure, sure. the postcolonial yeah. realist that you wrote about mm-hmm. in your dissertation. Yeah, uh, they influence me a lot in this uh, paradoxical position that reality doesn't pre-exist. It's not something fixed uh, that you can uh, analyze as something that doesn't move, but is something in evo- ev- evolution. And but there are something fixed, which are the general categories that are not only epistemological constructs of the mind but uh, reifications of uh, collectives uh, in, in certain fields. So Ian Hamilton Grant, one of the authors of this I tackle in the book, uh, has a um, book on, on Schelling, which has influenced me a lot. In that book, he uh, mixed Plato with Schelling, uh, the Timaeus from Plato and the works of Schelling in his uh, early years. And that was that has been very influential for me. Also, uh, Marcus Gabriel concepts of um, fields of sense. That's I think the, the translation to English has been very influential to me. That's more or less the the influence. Yeah, and that, and the difference has to has to be with uh, the emphasis on nature. I think that mm-hmm. is uh, it's it's also a political decision. It's not a, a politically neutral decision to. Uh, focus my philosophical activity in those two words that are very polemic and uh, in the in 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 this uh, later years and will be more polemical in the future with the ecological crisis and all the feminist and lgbt uh, queer uh, studies and debate yeah so it's a it's a decision to i think if uh, one of the one of the imp- I know if improvements, but difference of um, naturalism, genetical naturalism, uh, from or or in contrast with uh, postcontinental realism, is that the link with these uh, common day problems or issues is more direct. I think uh, that uh, in the in the in postcontinental realism, where they they are mostly accused of being uh, in a ivory tower, uh, thinking about reality and categories and all of these things, but without engaging in uh, in the general day, in the common man or, me- or woman uh, problems. You know, out of curiosity, Ernesto, it looks to me like a lot of the work on these authors and post-continental realists has been done in the uh, English-speaking world or in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, has has any work been done on them in the Spanish-speaking world besides your own? <laughs> no, that, that has been that has been also uh, in Mexico, and mm-hmm. the one of the of the uh, professors who were at my dissertation or PhD dissertation. Uh, Teodoro, I doesn't remember very well the uh, the family name. Teodoro Garcia something uh, is a professor in in Mexico and has translated. Uh, I think Marcus Gabriel. Marcus Gabriel is the one who, as a, a polyglot, 
has uh, been um, more welcomed in the Spanish speaking world since mm -hmm. uh, he speaks uh, Spanish, uh, uh, French, Italian, Portuguese, uh, Chinese. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, he's a prodigy, the, 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 um, yeah, the fan terrible of uh, German philosophy and and he's he's a very nice guy. The, we the book is published in a in a collection in Mor Sibek, a German publishing house, uh, curated by um, Marcus Gabriel. Uh, was uh, uh, was uh, Marcus Gabriel who, uh, when we met in in Spain, uh, tell me, uh, told me uh, um, proposed me to publish the the book in in his uh, not in his publishing house but in in this particular uh, collection yeah and and there has been a lot of interest i as i have said uh, there are some publishing houses like caja negra mm -hmm. or materia oscura the one who has uh, published me or olobionte in spain that are interested not only in postcontinental realism which is i think a freakish uh, is something uh, for freaks, I think, <laughs> of philosophy. Uh, let, let, very... Let's say for, for, for specialists, maybe. Right? For specialists, yeah. <laughs> let's let's say that euphemism, yeah. <laughs> and and but they, they are also interested in uh, in accelerationism, which is the more or less the political uh, move um, movement of uh, linked with a post continental realism, and also new mat feminist materialism. Uh, Donna Haraway, Karen Barad. Uh, Jane Bennett, there are mm -hmm. some f feminist philosophers that uh, that and they they are the ones who uh, who put the accent on on nature and I mm -hmm. think that's the that's the interesting debate how to construct a concept of nature that doesn't uh, falls back on essentialism and substantialist uh, views which mm -hmm. has been uh, have been uh, mm, is yeah destroyed by mm -hmm. 20th century philosophy now you mentioned before that or we've been talking about the fact that you've been working on devising creating your own uh philosophical system constructing your own philosophical system and i'm wondering in in your view uh, what are the advantages uh, uh, for a philosopher to devise his or her own philosophical system in comparison with authors who never cared or were interested in systematizing their thinking in that way? Mm -hmm. I think philosophy uh, is always systematic. When you think the um, concepts uh, seriously and profoundly, uh, inevitably you uh, stumble across other fields uh, you don't imagine uh, important in the first view. For example, if you I work on the field of ethi of ethics. Later or sooner, you will have to tackle anthropological questions like uh, what is a person, what intention means, what is good and what is bad, and these uh, concepts are linked with anthropology, ontology, epistemology, uh, and that's the reason why you have to be systematic. If you don't, if, if you are inevitably systematic, uh, if you don't construct your own philosophical system is because you are working in some philosopher philosophical system in the analytical tradition there is a expression the received view the in the la uh, uh, concepción heredada we say in the spanish speaking world which is more uh, strong no the mm -hmm. uh, Concepción heredada is the uh, inherited view, no? Inherited, in, inherited conception. view, yeah, that's right. Yeah, the inherited view. So you inherit from your fathers or from the philosophers that uh, have been systematical, uh, systematical before you, a uh, uh, work, uh, a field in which you uh, you are like a, a, a work field, uh, like a, a, a troop soldier, and there are some generals who say in which direction are the pro if. if is the since in philosophy you cannot have like a zero degree approach to mm -hmm. problems uh, is the system is the philosophical system the one who says what is problematic what doesn't uh, doesn't uh, what it doesn't uh, get uh, problems across 
And that's more or less the, the approach I will say. Yeah, It's inevitable to be systematic in philosophy uh, as in science. In sci but what happens in science is that the uh, scientific project in which you work puts the system, puts the cage, and you just work uh, uh, in the cage. No, uh, philo Philosophy tries to make a bigger cage and tries not to think out of the cage, but in a bigger and more systematically thought cage. That's more or less the, the approach, yeah. So, so I guess what you mean is that uh, even those philosophers who claim or who uh, don't seem to have a system, they actually do have a system in a way. Yeah, that received view, uh, it's uh, always there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, your book, uh, Realismo Postcontinental, has uh, recently been translated into English, uh, you mentioned before, by your brother and his fiance. Uh, and I'm wondering, um, looking at this book and thinking about this book in English translation, uh, why is it important to you, Ernesto, that, that, that the book be now available in English translation? Mm -hmm. Why is it important to you that the book has been translated into English of all languages? And uh, what kind of English-speaking uh, readership uh, are you targeting with this book? Mm -hmm. When Mor Siegebeck offered uh, me to translate the book, and uh, we were uh, mm, regarding the possibility of translating it to German or to English. Uh, this collection has uh, books in these two languages, and I thought it better to be translated to English since German is very difficult, it's 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 a, a it it will be like a, a daydream, a living dream to be my book in the language of Kant, Heidegger, and Nietzsche. But I think uh, I it, it will have a bigger audience or potential audience mm -hmm. or potential readership if it will be it uh, be translated to English. So. And I speak more fluently in in English than in German. If my <laughs> if you think my English is bad, <laughs> yes, look or wait for my German. <laughs> well, well, well I, I never said your English was bad in the least. <laughs> my German is is isn't workable either. So don't don't worry uh, yeah. about that. <laughs> so, uh, so, but what, what kind of uh, uh, readership uh, do you think that this book is going to have in the English speaking world? Do you think it'll be different? from uh, you know, the readership that your book already has in Spanish? Uh, is it going to be bigger? Uh, how, how do you imagine know. that? For the moment, I think uh, Spanish professors <laughs> in the U.S. <laughs> is, is a, very, a very big target, yeah? So <laughs> well, there, there are quite a few of us. <laughs> yeah, so that's, uh, that's more or less the, the, the first target. There is no target. This is a book that uh, is pre pretended to be wrote in a in a very neutral uh, language. I, in my, in other books, in a, in a more like divulgative or experimental books, I make a lot of jokes and I also, I'm also very autofictional about myself. Uh, I have um, several essays on political and uh, artistical, aesthetical uh, topics in which I, I'm, yeah, I'm more more autofictional and more uh, fun, I will say, or, or make more jokes. In this book, there is a satirical uh, approach to all the authors, and that's a thing that has been also improved by Manuela Natalia. Manuel Antonio Castro Cordova and Natalia Baizan have uh, been uh, very free to uh, translate mostly... Um, uh, dicta or or uh, proverbs from Spanish to English. For example, in the chapter on Mauricio Ferraris, I say that Mauricio Ferraris abarca mucho pero aprieta poco. <laughs> uh, and they have translated to Mauricio Ferraris, a jack of all spades, a master of none. Uh, so, ja I, I, <laughs> jack of all spades. spades. Jack of all trades. Oh, sorry. Jack. Yeah. Of, they are the translators. Jack of all trades, master of none. That's it. Jack of all trades, master of none. And mm, mm, they have been very free to to work in in this uh, in this way. Yeah. 
that's more or less the and there is no there is no target more than people interested in philosophy is to it pretends to be a, a book that every adult man or woman that uh, is interested more or less in in philosophy and doesn't have a, a um, career in philosophy can I I I have wrote it uh, for this uh, type of uh, readership yeah mm -hmm. um, since in the introduction a very the very big introduction of the book uh, more than a hundred pages long I do I reconstruct the history of philosophy mostly medieval philosophy from the pro from the point of view of realism and I um, it's more that's more or less what what I have uh, written in the in a kind of a, it's not it's not only an introduction to the book but also also an introduction to the a history of philosophy what you have to know to understand why these authors uh, engage in problems that are important for philosophy that's more or less the the function of the introduction not only an introduction to the authors but also an introduction to the history of philosophy and to the problems uh, put uh, forward by realists is, is the english translation in any way different from the spanish uh, original is, are there any addition or subtractions mm. or anything yeah. like that we have included a prologue by my phd tutor uh, jose luis villacañas but this is not a it has been also included in a re-edition of the book in in the Spanish Spanish. We are going to present it next week in Madrid in La Libreria Meta and uh, with the, the two books at the, at the same time, the Spanish one and the translation to English. And they are they we have corrected a lot of uh, how do you say it uh, print uh, errors mm -hmm. from from the Spanish edition. Uh, any typos by translating, or, or... Ta yeah, typos. Yeah. That, that, that's it. That they need typos. Um, Manuela and Natalia have been very uh, thoughtful and also have, have uh, all the typos that were left uh, have been corrected in both editions, in in English and in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Now, since we're talking about language, and while we're on the topic, uh, do, do you think uh, that in any way the language in which a philosophical text is written? Uh, may in any way affect the form or the content of this philosophical text. Uh, uh, like if, if the text is, is written in Spanish or in Greek or in Latin or in German uh, or in Polish, uh, do you think that determines in a way the form or the content? Or do you think there's no connection between the language and the text itself? Huh, huh. I know yeah, it's that, a hard question, a, but it's no, something that I've, very... always, I've always been interested in this in this idea. Yeah. Uh... There is uh, there are two authors who ha uh, who put forward a, a hypothesis in that di direction. I I don't remember the, the their names now. I more or less I I don't know. I, I won't uh, make any guesses, but it's a very debated uh, uh, issue, mm -hmm. and it's connected with the debate about uh, realism since uh, mo most. Uh, what we call in the in the philosophical tradition nominalist think that concepts are only nouns and depending on the nouns the expressions the language in which you talk you think differently that's a very nominalistic way of thinking about philosophy and that's fun because nominalism and em empiricism is a very anglo-saxon tradition uh, uh, we tend to identify um, the Enlightenment, the uh, Scottish en Enlightenment, with uh, universal thinking and um, removal of the barriers between people, but uh, an a a empiricist uh, anthropology have uh, is the one who has uh, been most uh, uh, supporter of this uh, view. This um, I will say also postmodern postmodern view that depending on which culture or language you think, you will think differently. This this famous quote of uh, Martin Heidegger that you can only make philosophy in German or Greek. I think that this is bullshit. This is bullshit. <laughs> yeah, that that's more or less my 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 abstract about this this thing. Mm. 
you can always uh, do a periphrastic uh, uh, phrase when you don't know a certain word in in a, in a, the Spanish speaking world. There are also uh, some chauvinists who who say that, uh, in fin, Sp Spanish is a very uh, advanced te technological <laughs> instrument, and since in Spanish you have the distinction between ser and estar, uh, be, but That, that's a, that's that's bullshit. You you, you uh, teach these these two verbs to the uh, English uh, students. You can say if there is an, a difference, if there is something that you can say in Spanish but you cannot say in English. I, I'm I'm very skeptic about this uh, kind of debates since they are uh, they are in the political agenda. In the identity politics, it's this, this these types of debates are very are very uh, influenced by this uh, identity politics, um, which is a kind of tribalism. I tend to think more in in philosophy as a as a as a topic that is more translatable than poetry and and prose. Mm -hmm. uh, from all the I will say it in that way, compared with poetry and Uh, narrative, which is difficult to translate, especially poetry. Uh, philosophy is more uh, comprehensible, uh, and 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 it, uh, yeah, that's more or less my my thesis. And also, if poetry, I, I don't speak uh, a lot of languages, and I, for for instance, Russia, Russian, but I like very much the poetry of Akhmatova or Pushkin, or, or also the Tolstoy, uh, Dostoevsky, and I haven't I haven't read a, a word in of, of those authors. I have read the translators, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know how is the word uh, the work of these authors or writers in their own language. But in Spanish, is incredible. Mm -hmm. So um, I will say that um, every language has uh, in every language there is a. A, a good philosopher, a good uh, writer or narrator or translator that uh, brings to this language Shakespeare or uh, Cervantes or Pushkin or whatever. Yeah, that's more or less my my point. And I, and I agree with that. And I think that uh, seeing it otherwise kind of brings more of a political component to the view more than more than anything having to do with language itself or with philosophy, because You know, in many ways, if you think about languages, some of them have easier things than others, but then they also have harder things than others. Like in, in English, you could argue that pronunciation and 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 uh, and um, uh, spelling is harder, you know, but maybe grammar is easier or with Spanish, it could be in a different way. But, you know, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's better or worse. It's just, you know, it's just the way the languages work. So mm. I definitely understand that. We have this uh, common friend, uh, Jose Maria Bellido Morillas, who uh, tends, uh, uh, tries to uh, pronounce uh, the names of the authors uh, of his uh, ideal library. And it's, the, it's, uh, it's comical in a way, since uh, in English, English is the most difficult language <laughs> in which he uh, pronounces very well the names in Chinese, in Japanese, in in uh, Persian or Farsi or whatever. <laughs> But when he tries to pronounce uh, names in English, uh, he always say, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> well, it <laughs> is true that funny. in English, un un until you hear a word, just by looking at a word, you can never be sure how it is pronounced. So uh, yeah. Jose Maria definitely has a point there. <laughs> Now, you mentioned, uh, you know, our common friend, Jose Maria, Jose Maria Bellido Morillas, and that reminds me of YouTube a little bit because, you know, he has a, a very interesting YouTube channel. Uh, and you also have, uh, from my uh, point of view, a very interesting uh, YouTube channel. You're very active on YouTube. Uh, you travel widely in Spain and abroad to give lectures, uh, to take part in conferences, in symposia. Uh, in what ways do you think, uh, Ernesto, that the internet and your own university teaching uh, shape your work as a philosopher, as an mm -hmm. author? Yeah, a lot. Since I, um, I re research mostly to uh, do my lectures in the university, I have this 
uh, I don't know if uh, discipline, I will say, to uh, always uh, make a new uh, project or research project each year for each course. I, I try not to repeat the topics of the course. Uh, more, it's inevitable to always uh, be interested in the same fields, more or less, but I try to approach it from different points of view. And uh, I know I have learned something when I can teach it. That's a very, uh, that's a, a, a proof. I have uh, learned it well, or, or or to a certain degree. I can, I have, I know I have learned something when I can teach that uh, thing in a in a certain way, not in a, a perfect way, and everything would you say it can be perfected, and that's that's interesting. Since uh, for for many years, I I have most of my research and work have been done orally uh, in lectures and talks. Since I had a lot of trouble with writing, since when you write, especially with uh, this type with Word and the uh, the the PC, the, the the computer, you can always rework, rewrite, and perfect it. And you never you never end, since uh, you can always have a longer um, deadline with the publishing house. But in in lectures or in talks, there is no uh, there is no um, there is a limit. There is a clear limit. You have to go to a place. You have to talk at certain hour at certain place. So whatever you have learned or read for um, has to be done to uh, to that day. That's, so you have that's to very important. You have to perform it in a way, right? You have to perform it. Yeah, and. Since the problem we face now with internet is that the bibliography is infinite. For for the most ridiculous topic, you have a, a bibliography that is a life work if you engage it seriously. And what we need is, yeah, you have to be, uh, you have to perform it. You have to to do it. That's that's more or less what I have. I will say about about. Uh, my work in the university and also internet. Internet has uh, av uh, availed me to, has, uh, uh, with internet, I have been able to um, access a lot of material uh, which is not uh, uh, accessible here in Spain or, or in my, in my uh, city. I have read a lot. I have um, downloaded uh, a lot of uh, PDFs I legally, I must, I must say, <laughs> I, I don't know how the university system works. I, I have always uh, entered uh, in uh, G Store by Sci-Hub. I, I must confess it, <laughs> and that that's more or less the what I will say. Internet is a has has given me all this bibliography, and the lecture system uh, has obliged me to uh, to per to have something to say uh, to in a certain date and in a certain place. That's more or less what ha puts me on a deadline, which is very important since you can, all the things in philosophy, you can always rethink it, rewrite it, and it's a, a work of a, of a lifetime, as we have said. Does the YouTube channel with 139,000 subscribers at, at this point and, you know, some 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 live meetings with some of the subscribers that you do monthly and that I follow here from the United States that could be followed anywhere in the world. Uh, does the YouTube channel have any uh, impact as well on 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 your activity as as a philosopher? Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's a good or a bad uh, influence since here in, in Spain and, and here in Madrid, most of mm, the people know me by one book I published, my my first big book uh, on uh, trap music, on uh, of on this uh, type of uh, urban music, and mm, this has uh, has has uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, ghetto at me more or less, put me in a ghetto or, or on an intellectual ghetto, to, how to say. Uh, for most of the people, I'm the philosopher of the trap, of trap philosopher, which is a very <laughs> weird uh, category or 
uh, yeah, the survey weird category. And and uh, that that it's it's uh, difficult. It's difficult to be this. Um, I have known uh, a lot of uh, great people. Uh, for instance, in in Mexico, Diego Ruzarín, uh, who has a greater audience than me. Uh, he is a very nice guy, and he invited me with other philosophers to Mexico, and it was it was a very nice time. But uh, I don't know. It's um, being famous and being philosopher are like two, I don't know if incompatible uh, ways of being, since the philosopher uh, tries to know the world and the famous uh, people are known by the world. And I don't know if if mm -hmm. being known by the world affects the way you know the world, mm -hmm. since it tends to be uh, narcissistic. The, you are informed by uh, what other people say about the world, but these people have you as a reference. Is this circularity? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Is a if it's a vicious or a virtuous uh, circle in which people that have this uh, public exposure are uh, in. But most of the experience are, are very good. Like this interview, uh, there are things that I have never said in English and in, in any language that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm trying to say now. But Thanks I guess of, that you, but, of but, your but, question, sure. But, but I guess that you're worried uh, because of your uh, YouTube channel and, and also because of the, that book about trap music, that urban music that has become so popular in Spain in the last several years. Uh, to be typecast, right? Like like an actor that always mm -hmm. plays the same kind of role. I think that's yeah, is that sure. kind of what you were trying to get at. Yeah, sure. <laughs> like yeah, yeah, like Jim Carrey. Like when <laughs> Jim Carrey was only a comic actor and he tried his best to be a generic uh, actor. That's more or less. Uh, it's one of my favorite <laughs> actors, uh, Jim Carrey. When I was a child, I I. I was laughing at all the all his movies and and the the history of Jim Carrey is very very interesting I will I will say mm -hmm. you know he paints also and he's he's a he's crazy man he's crazy so yeah I more or less I will say I, I prefer to be known as the Jim Carrey of philosophy <laughs> better than <laughs> the philosopher of uh, trap. Well, Ernesto, as, as we're winding down the conversation, as we're uh, finishing the uh, interview today, I have a couple more questions for you uh, that I would like to get uh, through before we uh, <clears throat> say our goodbyes today. And one of them has to do with another book that you have recently published and that I have read in Spanish. This one is not available in English at this point yet. Uh, Jantipa o del morir, uh, Sancepi or on dying would be the translation of the title into into English. And in this book, you use the genre of the dialogue, the philosophical dialogue, as a vehicle to explore philosophical content by blending historical and fictional elements. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, what is your view on the relationship between literature and philosophy? In what ways, mm -hmm. uh, from your point of view, do literature and philosophy intersect? The relationship has been historically polemic, difficult, uh, since uh, Plato, Plato uh, expels famously the poets from his ideal republic. And the reason is that uh, from the point of view of uh, Platonic uh, philosophy, uh, artists, poets uh, work with uh, fictions, appearances, and are not interested in the truth and the good in the in in the universals, so to speak, and but I will say that Plato is the perfect example that you can be a first rank philosopher and a first rank writer. Uh, philosophy, when it uh, is expressed orally, has inevitably some rhetorical features, and when it's put it down in paper or in laptop, it has uh, some poetical. Uh, features is inevitable when you write and when you speak r rhetoric and poetic is uh, working uh, in the um, in the in the back so to speak no and uh, I've always been uh, conscious about this 
aesthetical, poetical, and rhetorical nature of uh, the exposition of philosophy in public. And um, yeah, that's more. And be, uh, having been a poet in the past, uh, I have I have always been interested in literature. I think there are some uh, generous uh, literature genres that are uh, very philosophical inter interesting. Like science fiction, for example, is the perfect example. In science fiction, you can tackle certain. Uh, political topics that are uh, difficult to engage with uh, in a more direct way. And that's more or less what I will say. We are also in a very interested moment in the uh, publishing world uh, since the last Nobel Prize for Literature was uh, given to uh, uh, Annie Ernaud, uh, which is a, who is a French writer who uh, works with uh, self-fiction. I don't know if you say self-fiction or auto-fiction. What some, do you say? In Some people say auto-fiction. Auto-fiction, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I guess it, what, what that uh, is taken to mean is uh, some kind of autobiographical uh, yeah. fiction, right? Yeah, but with with certain deviations from the historical or biographical truth, uh, with with and with those deviations, you can make uh, uh, some uh, political, sociological, or also philosophical points. That's more or less my 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 approach to it. In Memorias Libros of, of del 15M, Memories and Libels, I will I don't know if this, this is the translation of uh, 15M. No, no, it will say it will be 15 5, it would, no? 915, uh, uh, May, so 05 15, right? 05 15, yeah, 05 15. Like 9 like, 11, like right? 9 11. 9 11. <laughs> so uh, 5 15, I guess. 5 15, yeah. <laughs> My, Memories and Libels of 5 15. This is a book I published. Uh, 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 last year in 2021 with the 10th uh, anniversary of this political movement in Spain, the movement of the indignados, uh, which was the father, for uh, if people don't know, of uh, Occupy Wall Street. O Occupy Wall Street in the, in the first weeks was uh, leaded by uh, people from Madrid who came uh, who came from the movement of indignados from uh, 515 515 is a very uh, funny name <laughs> for the movement 515 and uh, the, in the first weeks of the of Occupy Wall Street the language uh, they spoke was uh, mainly Spanish because there were there were a lot of Latinos and and mm -hmm. these people from Madrid who came from uh, five, the 515 movement and in that book I, I was saying, I use autofiction to link the debates of that year, 2011, with the uh, feminist movement and other debates, political, philosophical, who have been uh, put forward in more recent years. So uh, that's, or, or I will I will put out another example. Uh, now Nausgor, uh, the famous. Uh, I don't know if he, he Swedish author. Yeah, I don't know if he's Swedish or Nor Norwegian. I think he's Swedish. The famous uh, of the who has this uh, septology called uh, My Struggle, like Hitler's book, My Struggle, has in the in the last book of this uh, auto auto fictional work, he has a uh, like three hundred uh, pages long essay on Hitler. And it's a, like a philosophical, psychological, historical work inside a, a, a narrative work. You mm -hmm. have also this kind of approach in Thomas Mann, Hermann Broch, so uh, Milan Kundera. So I think, um, and I will say, in the in the Spanish-speaking world, narrative and literature have a very have has more uh, profound philosophical output than uh, philosophy itself. It's a very interesting and, and question to, to, to understand why, but that's the uh, Cervantes is a, a philosophical figure uh, over, uh, over 
whatever philosopher would you can whoever philosopher you can imagine in the spanish speaking world and that's also the position of shakespeare that's also the position of of kafka and i would say it it also is also the position of sophocles for example in the greek world uh, so yeah philosophy uh, is more explicit that's that's more uh, the point philosophy as a as a genre as a as a genre uh, fixed on essays and uh, and manuals and uh, books for uh, teaching in class is more explicit about the problems the conceptual problems but these problems can be traced back to uh, sophocles mm-hmm. uh, cervantes uh, shakespeare kafka mm-hmm. So uh, you, I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, now that we're finishing our uh, conversation, uh, I mentioned that you had just published your seventh book. So book number seven, so you, you're an incredibly uh, prolific author. And so I'm wondering if you could maybe uh, talk briefly about any projects on which uh, you are currently working or any events in which you will be taking part in the next few months. I know that recently you've been uh, to New York City um, and now you're back in Spain from from that trip. But what are you working on right now? And are there any events that we should be keeping an eye out on? Hmm. If um, if, if you can the, talk about them, if if it's if yeah. it's if it's allowed, <laughs> no, I, it's not the CIA, <laughs> <laughs> the FBI. No. Um, next February uh, will be uh, will appear the second part of the. Platonic trilogy. The first uh, part was uh, Shantip or Ondine, and the second part is called Perictioni or uh, or on liberty or freedom, yeah, or on freedom. And it's fun because uh, the protagonist of this uh, second part is an American. Uh, uh, it's a girl from the U.S. Uh, from Florida, from. Uh, uh, a town in Florida, who which has the most percentage of Greek uh, uh, origin, uh, Greek Greek descent people, Tarpon Springs. Tarpon Springs, uh, near Tampa, is a town who has like fifty uh, percent uh, Greek descent people, and uh, it's a. I, I it's I try to make like a, a joke like this this girl called Perictione calls is called Perictione since she comes from a, a Greek background and it will be published in in February the second part in in Spanish and also uh, now uh, this this last week I just published El Gran Pan Muerto uh, the Great Pan is Dead which uh, will be also published in in Chile. Uh, Shantip was published in Colombia. I don't know if uh, we are talking with uh, Colombia, Planeta, Planeta Colombia, if they will publish also uh, Perictioni and Lastenia, the, the last part of the trilogy. And this is more or less what I'm working on. I, I'm also going to teach next uh, year in Reina Sofia Museum, the famous museum in Madrid, who has the Guernica, the Picasso's uh, painting, and I'm going to teach there uh, contemporary aesthetics. So I I'm also preparing that course. That this is more or less the, the thing during the the course during the semester. I'm as all the teachers. Uh, so um, how to say it. so uh, you, you broken just work, you, i will you, say broken <laughs> i will say also broken i am so broken with classes i'm so uh, so you're you're stuck. you're o- overflowed with, with yeah classes. i'm overflowed that's, you, you, have, that's you have a lot of classes yeah that's it i'm overflowed with with the flow of of the <laughs> classes so uh, i go with the flow i go with the flow <laughs> and we can't forget also your poetry book that's coming out yeah, the poetry book, which will be published on uh, September, October uh, uh, 2020, uh, 20, uh, 20, 23rd, 23rd, no? Will be. 2023, yes. So. 2023, sorry. My, <laughs> one hour speaking in English. <laughs> my my brain is, uh, is overflowed also. <laughs> and for anyone that might be interested in uh, knowing more about 
uh, Ernesto Castro. Uh, they can check out his YouTube channel on YouTube by just uh, typing in Ernesto Castro, his name on on there and then the search bar and they'll find the uh, YouTube channel. And then there's also a hey website, ErnestoCastro.com. Is there a, a, an English version of that website or? Yeah, or we are working in the English version. Uh, we, don't, we don't have much uh, material. Uh, we have the, the this book, uh, Postcontinental Realism. And also there is an article I wrote about uh, Jordan Peterson several years back. And it's very curious how uh, a Slovenian magazine uh, translated it to English. Uh, I don't know what happens in Slovenia. Uh, Slavoj Žižek <laughs> is one <laughs> Madeleine dollar, but, but um, they are. I, I have published several articles in English, uh, but all in all in this uh, Slovenian magazine. So I'm open to work with any I don't know philosophical magazine or political magazine or sociological magazine that will be interested in my articles. Uh, that's that's a, I think I am very open about. I will say, yeah. Ernesto Castro, it really has been a pleasure talking to you, and I appreciate your uh, effort in uh, uh, doing this uh, English language interview. I wish you uh, all the best, and I hope to be able to stay in touch with you. Thank you very much, and all the best from Jackson, Tennessee. Thanks, Anton. This has been a conversation with uh, Spanish philosopher Ernesto Castro. My name is Anton Garcia Fernandez, signing off from Jackson, Tennessee. Thanks, everybody, and so long for now.